Hey all, welcome to a great discussion with Dr. Ben. Dr. Ben Bacacchio, that is. So I interviewed Ben in 2016 in San Diego. Fantastic guy. And he set up the first gyms that were high volume back in the 1970s or 80s. And he still looks fantastic today in his 70s because he knows the secret of true fat loss through the best methods. So he has a couple of PhDs and he knows all about stress training, the right training, 15 minutes twice a week even with huge benefits. So really fascinating discussion. And as it happens, I also mentioned my Whoop device, which I'm wedded to, uh, find it an enormous assistance. And Ben was not too knowledgeable on heart rate variability or HRV. So we chat about that as well. And at the end, I have a discount for this incredible technology, but I'll get into that at the end. Here we go. Hey guys, delighted to be back chatting with my good friend, Dr. Ben Boccaccio, who set up some of the first uh, really efficient gyms targeted at fat loss, etc. I think he has a couple of PhDs and we chatted in San Diego and we had a couple of pods before. But anyway, great to be back. Hey, how are you doing, Ben? Ah, great to see you again, Ivor. Always a pleasure. Yeah, it's good times. I think it was back in 16 or 17. We were in San Diego and you came up to me. You were showing me your book and we were chatting. But a uh, simpler world back then. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but we won't get into that stuff. So here, I just want to catch up again. And you had an idea or two on stuff you might want to talk about. Maybe we could do, though, a really quick recap on what are really the most efficient exercise regimes in very short periods of time and why? Okay, well, I mean, I, I've always been kind of a minimalist. In other words, for, for almost any kind of behavior that requires any kind of discipline, which most of the good ones seem to. Um, so what, what's the least amount of an intrusion I can make on my lifestyle and get the best bang for my buck for benefit? Okay, and I think that helps us as providers of this information make our message more palatable. If I tell somebody, you know, you got to go to a monastery, you've got to do this, you know, you're going to be secluded from the world, you can't do anything you're used to, I, you know, I'm whistling in the wind here. So I'm trying to make this stuff applicable and powerful, obviously safe. And I've done the same thing with exercise. Now, my background was as a fairly elite athlete, hopefully not one of these, you know, the older I get, the better I was, guys. But I was a pretty fair athlete and always interested in the training and the preparation for the events and for competition. And so that's where, that's where I kind of started. And then I took my degrees to learn about the different sciences, you know, anatomy, physiology, kinesiology, exercise physics. And I've got PhD in exercise physiology and a separate PhD in health with a specialization in exercise. And, and that I stressed um, the relevance of the, the, the relationship between exercise and fat related disorders. And I named them fat related disorders because I assumed and observed clinically that fat is a problem over fat, the inability to store fat in a healthy manner, whether we're talking about diabetes, whether we're talking about Alzheimer's, whether we're talking about you know, obesity, any of these things, inflammatory markers for cancer, you know, anyway, so that was my interest. And so I designed a system, uh, basically exercise is just muscle fiber recruitment, you know, in a pattern. And I designed a pattern that I thought would be universally helpful for all of the, all of the attributes that uh, muscle stimulation could basically generate. Now, my bias, and I'll admit my bias, or at least my study bias, has been that the muscle system is very underrated. And we are now, you know, thankfully for me, understanding the mechanisms by which the muscle system is really the generator of all metabolic activity. For example, we would not have a cardiovascular system that could pump blood at many times that of resting if it wasn't for the impetus of muscle stimulation. We wouldn't have a respiratory system that could exchange oxygen at 10 times resting if it wasn't for the fact that we would have some kind of muscle stimulation to require that. Even, you know, the heart itself, the brain wouldn't have been as developed if it wasn't for the impetus, you know, the inst instigation of, of muscle action. 
And now, you know, we've had this thing, you know, you can't outrun a bad diet, which just annoys the hell out of me because it's a, it's an ignorant statement. I mean, in, in the, the definition of ignorance, not knowing, well, why would you make a statement like that? And I understand that people think, well, I'm going to go out and start walking and jogging and I'm going to lose all this weight and, and not have any kind of a, uh, interpretation of the fact that, you know, you need to change. Obviously, you can't eat, you know, cookies and candy and cake. I mean, but I think that's almost a, a, an overview, you know, an overlook saying that, of course, people know that. Nobody's ever come to me that I've had. I've and says, I'm going to eat all the shit that I possibly want, and, but I'm going to get in shape by doing this exercise. And I, I have not had one person tell me that. So I, I don't think that's the case. So my stance has been, let me demonstrate to you through the literature and obviously through 50 years now that I've been in practice, uh, that this is a very important part of regulating our metabolism. One of, one of, of those issues is regulating energy, energy intake, energy storage, energy utilization. And that's basically this whole business, Ivor, your book, my book, the low carb, <laughs> all these movements, I don't think would exist if it wasn't for the fact that people are just too fat, either clinically or cosmetically or whatever, however they measure it. And that's a problem. Okay. That to me is a problem. And in essence, how do we adjust? How do we arrange the human situation? And why has it gotten so kind of uh, pr predominant now, as opposed to maybe 50, 60 years ago? And so that's what I've been studying. That's what I've been working on. So I consider myself kind of an expert at manipulating the muscle system because there has been so many studies, especially recently, recently, the last three or four years that indicate the exact mechanism as to how muscles cross talk with fat cells, how the, inf how the influence of exercise directly influ influences visceral fat. Okay. These are identified metabolic mechanisms, how, how, how the, how exercise, um, can over, overcome the need for insulin and get glucose into cells, okay, through AMPK. I mean, these are all, this is not stuff Dr. Ben made up. This is stuff that's just for pure physiology and how the muscles have this powerful influence uh, on all of these factors that we're trying to accomplish. So in my mind, I'm kind of a um, signals, uh, a signals guy, you know, what signals do we want to send? What metabolism? What pathways do we want to instigate? And we can break this stuff down, I think, through eating, you know, beta hydroxybutyrate, you know, that comes from fasting and comes from keto eating. Why is it so beneficial? So we can identify the pathways that it upregulates or inhibits, and we can maneuver that through our behavior. The same thing, just as powerfully, in my opinion, can be accomplished through manipulating muscle fiber stimulation or what I call exercise. Okay, so that's really where I come from. How can I make myself, make my patients and clients healthier by the uh, safe, uh, efficient application of muscle stimulation or exercise? And that's what I've basically designed and developed. And seems to be either I'm very lucky for 50 years or there may be something to it. Absolutely, there's something to it, more than something, Ben. But yeah, you know, it just reminded me there when you talked about signaling, and obviously I have an obsession with signaling pathways too, uh, but Dr. Ron Rosedale once memorably said in an amazing talk, he said, all disease is an issue of miscommunication. Uh, there is no exception to that fact. And of course, he was talking mainly about the miscommunication of insulin and glucose signaling at that time, but, but it generally applies. And you know, you want to signal with your ideal exercise, which also is very palatable because it's short uh, bursts a couple of times a week, it's, it's manageable for people, but it's essentially signaling the generation of new muscle, which will act in so many beneficial ways that you touched on as a glucose sink and myriad other benefits. So maybe we'll talk briefly about that ideal kind of exercise regime to get the benefits. Okay. So, you know, go, going back to real basic uh, physiology, uh, anatomy, we have four different kinds of what we call different strata or different types of muscle fiber. That, and they're, they're delineated by the energy system they use, the, their duration of uh, exposure, in other words, how, how much endurance they have, how much strength they have, 
how much tension they can produce, and also by the metabolic byproducts of fatigue that they produce. So if we understand these, and I have a chart <laughs> that I, I get kidded about, if, if I would give you a talk about broccoli, I would probably put my muscle fiber chart in there. Because to me, it's the whole essence of the science of exercise physiology, and maybe really active physiology. Um, so each of these muscle fibers strata or, or, or types were designed to handle a certain amount of load. You know, as a developing species, we had to walk. An interesting aside, Ivor, is that I think something like 85, 90% of all humans walk most efficiently, meaning get the most miles per gallon out of their uh, energy between 3.4 and 3.8 miles an hour. Now, to me, you know, whether you're three and a half feet tall or seven feet tall, okay? Now, to me, this kind of represents, my interpretation of that is, that's the speed that the herd or the pack or the family or the tribe moved as we were generating this DNA, you know, creating the human DNA that was hardwired into us, okay? That, I, I call that activity. That was part of what we do. That's the reason we don't want to be sedentary because sedentary behavior is ca counterproductive to our health. We know that just being sedentary, for example, which means sitting on your butt for hours, even if you do exercise once a day or whatever, but sitting on your butt for hours in an office can be damaging. I've seen, done some study with Arizona State University, and just the fact that you're sedentary can be just as damaging a cardiometabolic risk equivalent to smoking cigarettes or being, you know, you know, overweight. So this sedentary behavior is one thing we want to abolish. Or, and it's very simple. Again, all of these fixes are kind of simple. We, we just did studies where people would just stand up for like 60 seconds every 90 minutes. And we could actually change that sedentary metabolic um, deficit. Okay, so don't sit on your butt for hours. Do something at the office. Walk to the bathroom. Walk down the hall. Walk up a flight of stairs once in a while. Okay, don't sit. Mm -hmm. That's activity. And I designate activity separate and distinctly from exercise. Exercise is a formal application at a certain level for a certain period of time at a certain intensity with certain recovery time. That to me is a formal application of muscle fiber stimulation that I consider exercise. That is what I've created. This we call it, I call it a smart system only because they wanted an acronym, but it's really high intensity exercise intermittently applied. So a big thing in exercise has been lately, and I, I started this you know, literally 50 years ago, is high-intensity interval training, okay? Now, take a look at what that says. High-intensity interval training. In my mind, if the exercise is actually high-intensity, it has to, by nature, be interval in nature because you can't sustain a high-intensity. You can't sprint you know, for two miles. It ain't happening, okay? There's, a, there's, a, there's an inhibition to that's being sustained. So, yes... We want to do this interval training and many, many studies. The literature is full of the fact that this is now becoming, yes, this is the best way to get efficient exercise and, and even more productive than, you know, the zone two stuff. And I can go into that and I, I have a whole uh, theoretical new model I would like to present on that, but that's another talk. Anyway, um, so what's the best way for us to get all of those muscle fibers stimulated to a threshold level. In other words, a level at which we will start to upwardly adapt to that stimulation. And how do we do it for all of these muscle fibers? Our endurance fibers, which are, um, which are fat burning, oxidative, our uh, high intensity fibers, which are glycolytic, sugar burning, okay? Well, and then the combinations thereof, okay? In my opinion, once we take all of those muscle fibers to a point of mechanical failure, Okay, which is what my system is about. Mechanical failure, meaning you can't perform another repetition in good style and good form. That externally correlates to internally to the metabolic threshold that now drives this upward adaptation for all of the, the, um, uh, the results that we're looking for. Endurance, muscle endurance, muscle strength, uh, protein synthesis. All of these are all the things that we're trying. These are the pathways we're trying to instigate to a threshold level. And I think that's important to a level at which you can irrevocably and irreversibly generate benefit. Okay. That's what I mean by threshold. And the, the threshold is not very high by physiological definition. You cannot work hard for a long period of time. So these, these um, 
Exposures to muscle stimulation to exercise must be short, must be intermittent because the recovery from these things take a few days. Okay, this is all physiology textbook stuff. It's not Dr. Ben's, you know, plan. This is, we can verify all of this stuff. So I manipulate the variables of frequency, intensity, duration, style, so that it's safe, efficient, productive, uh, universally applicable. That's how I measure the benefit of an exercise program. And that's basically what I think I've accomplished. And the, the, the plan is never, you know, done. If there's an improvement, I'm the first guy on that bandwagon. I mean, let, let me know. I haven't seen it. But if somebody shows it to me, I'm, I'm there. I'm the, uh, tomorrow, that's my deal, okay? So that's where I'm coming from as far as this kind of exercise. Now, one other thing on high-intensity exercise, interval training, okay? This is just my, you know, and you know me. I'm kind of a practical guy, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, uh, Vinny and my cousin Vinny. And like, I don't, don't, you can't pull that wool over my eyes. I can see, you know, I'm that kind of guy, you know, a little wise-ass little Italian kid from New York. But so if you're telling me that you're going to do an elliptical machine or a treadmill, you're going to do intervals. You're going to sprint, you're going to walk, you're going to sprint, you're going to walk, you're going to do 10 intervals. That's high intensity training. And, and many studies show that's a very, very productive and efficient way to train. So me being a little bit of a wise guy say, you know, I know, and I've written that there are both local and global benefits of exercise, meaning the muscle that you're working locally and globally, you're supporting that your respiratory system, your hormone system, your nervous system, your cardiovascular system are supporting that local impetus, okay? But you also have this global response. And we were always taught that, you know, global, long-term, low, slow running was the best for your heart. And it actually is not, okay? <laughs> the actual mechanism of real aerobic training is accomplished by recovering from anaerobic training. And that's a whole other subtle kind of nuance. But trust me when I tell you, we can measure any way you want to evaluate heart performance, heart health. Um, you know, status, healthy status can be accomplished through high intensity interval training. The only problem I have with conventional high intensity interval training, HIIT training, is that we're using the same muscles for the same movements in every interval. So no one can tell me, and no one has shown this, that by the fifth or sixth or seventh interval, you can actually work at a high intensity. Now, it can be difficult, it can be challenging, but is it really high intensity muscle fiber is it recruiting the muscle fibers that we're trying to trying to prove to get the biggest bang for our buck i don't think so okay because it, it even though it's difficult and it's hard to recover from and it's exhausting it is not high intensity high intensity training is not digging a 20-foot ditch six feet deep that's very difficult it'll make you sore you'll sweat but that is not high intensity exercise that's manual labor okay and that's not what i'm, I'm about so how do I do my high intensity interval training, Ivor? I do each one of my intervals with a fresh set of muscles capable of high intensity muscle fiber recruitment. And you know my system, I'll do quadriceps, hamstrings, lats, shoulders, chest, thighs, whatever, we go down the line from large to small. So now every interval I do locally is with a fresh set of muscles capable of working hard and taxing those high intensity fibers and I'm still globally having to support that just like I would do my first or second or third interval on the treadmill, but with a fresh set of muscles. So now I'm not only getting the local benefit of all my major muscle groups, I'm getting the global benefit with fresh muscles driving that global support. And I think that's the difference between high intensity, generally conventional high intensity exercise and what I do. I hope that's understandable. Oh, no, that's perfect. And I can paraphrase it. Yeah, you, you want to work through different muscles rather than like pumping out your high intensity with sprints. That's your thighs, et cetera, et cetera. But you want to work through a whole series of muscle groups from large to small. And let's say for a kind of an overweight accountant, middle aged, who's starting off, you know, they'll do uh, basically exercises to failure but ideally more work through the major muscle groups each one fresh push it to failure to generate those signals they mightn't go all the way down to all the little muscles they might have five or six major groups starting off but but they're moving to a fresh muscle group so maybe press ups to failure and then move to squats to failure which won't be too long for a kind of overweight accountant right who's new to this yeah, 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 you're right. yeah and move through 
And maybe in your your book, actually, your original book, I think was the 15 minute workout, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. That that's it, that in 15 minutes, two or three times a week, allowing for recovery and the signals to take hold, you, you've got like 40 or 50 minutes a week, you do it intense, you use multiple groups, you push it to failure, but it's still less than an hour in the week. Oh, it's, it's usually about 30 or 40 minutes a week in total, honestly. Now, one, one interesting you know, description, you got this you know, uh, out of shape executive or whatever, and I say, oh, is, isn't it dangerous for them to work at a high intensity? No, because high intensity for them, okay, means they're recruiting their type 2B muscle fibers, but for them, it may be a wall seat for 25 seconds. That may be get them into their high intensity. So in the beginning, it's almost, it's easy, easy or simple yeah. because they're not capable of working hard. Counterintuitively, the stronger you are, the harder it is to get this kind of recruitment to, to a threshold, okay? Because you, and the recovery becomes more difficult because you're so strong, you can make inroads into this recovery system. So a, a little bit, this is a little cerebral. You have to learn some stuff and it's, it's kind of like at, on face. Wow, that sounds weird, but pr proven to work and the, and the physiology and, and the science and now the literature is so supportive. You know, it's like everybody's patting me on the back because of this new great concept. And I said, oh, thanks. You know, this, I only started this 50 years ago, but, but still, yeah, there's so much literature on this. And, and the, the, the latest literature on the muscle um, talking to fat cells. I mean, to me, I've, I've seen people lose body fat. Honestly, I were just doing this twice a week, 15 minutes. Now, I recommend that they're more active if they have the capacity. But... You and I know some people that don't even walk their dogs. I mean, they don't do squat. They do nothing. Okay. But I know I can derive a, a very large percentage of benefits from muscle stimulation or exercise through this small exposure done properly and recovered from. Uh, um, and so to me, I got lucky. Let's face it, Ivor. I did this initially for elite athletes who didn't have a lot of time to do training because they were doing their sport, you know. And I said, well, let's get this done, get in and out of Dodge, but stay strong. Uh, traditionally, through the season, most athletes get weaker, more susceptible to injury because they're just so overworked. So we want to maintain, and they get weaker. And we want to maintain that strength. And this is how I've designed that they could do this. So I, I have even workouts that took like 10 minutes. I mean, just maintain this strength through the season. You'd be way ahead of the game for the other participants who just get weaker and weaker. And that's historically been the case. And as it turns out, it's pretty much the same kind of thing. It's perfect for the fat executive. Uh, only they'll they'll hit their thresholds easier, shorter time. And if they want to keep progressing and get really, really fit, okay, they'll have to do a little more to reach those thresholds. But hey, they're on the up then anyway, and they've already lost a bunch of weight and got way fitter. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the concept. I mean, I have had such good success for so many years in my whole business, I always thought was really pared down to body composition. Almost everybody wants to get leaner, more muscle mass, and less fat. And to me, you measure that in body composition. And when you do that, talk about the correlatives. I mean, body composition, I'm not BMI now, not height, weight, body composition, how much fat you have as opposed to how much muscle. If we get that going in the right trajectory, I would. I know because I've done it. I've measured it. We've done blood work and all this other stuff. It is so benign and beneficial in driving towards metabolic, what we call metabolic health, that, that I am annoyed when some of my very smart, very successful cohorts push exercise to the back because they, they, they think about exercise in that flawed thermodynamic way. They think, I'm going to burn 100 calories walking or running, and therefore, I can eat 100 calories more or I'm going to create this deficit. That is not how this works. Even in eating, we know it's not, you know, just I'm going to eat 100 calories less or 500 calories less. What is the, What are the pathways? What are the signals that eating that food at that quality, at, at, at that quantity, at that time, what are the effects? What are the pathways that that food instigates? Not simply how many calories does that food contain? And with regard to exercise, the thermodynamic model is flawed. It's not how many calories I burn doing the exercise, is what signals am I sending by that muscle stimulation 
and by the metabolites, the chemicals, okay, that instigate responses in your body. That's what's important. What's the effect of the eating and what's the effect of the exercise on driving the pathways that we want to that are correlated to our health and an upward kind of adaptation? Yeah. And the perfect synergy, of course, is the right exercise, as in your book and what we've described, and combine it with a low-carb, healthy, high-protein, real foods diet. Put the two together and you get magic, and that's the reality. And, you know, you told me, I remember, about a study way back in 16, and I, I looked it up after you sent me the link, and it was just a study with older people, I think, and it just got them to do really simple things could they get up off the floor using one arm and just simple and it predicted their mortality in the next 10 years way better than all the blood risk factors put together and it was just a measure of their muscle capability at that older age it was not it you're you're co combining two studies but ruiz and blair in 2007 i'm pretty sure um tested all kinds of variables and correlated them individually to longevity okay the number one correlative to longevity, not diabetes, not obesity, not smoking, muscle strength. If you're in the top third for your gender and age and muscle strength, you are 40% less likely to die of cancer and 40% more likely to live to be 100. Muscle strength. Okay, so you'll say, what the hell? You know, how is that? So here's, here's my understanding and explanation. If your muscle system can maintain this level of function, okay, because you're in the top third, okay, what has to be what has to be occurring? Your support systems, your cardiovascular system, your respiratory system, your hormone system, your skeletal system have to be working at a pretty high level to support that demand and that capacity. So not so hard to believe, is it? If you understand again the importance of that muscle system being a demonstration of the other systems functioning at a high healthy level yeah it makes absolute sense and of course the muscle by being more advanced and being uh, just in better shape it too is acting as an organ a glucose sink and and giving you myriad benefits yeah we can go into that i mean obviously glycogen storage is is obviously one of our major methods for taking glucose or high blood sugar out of the bloodstream and reducing insulin requirement and the, the, the constant high levels of insulin, which we know insulin resistance being probably the root cause of many of our metabolic issues and problems. So yeah, there's no question that, that the glycogen flux, the, the input of, uh, from glucose in your blood into storage in glycogen in your muscles is enhanced enormously enhanced in, in, in more developed or stronger or larger muscles, okay? And that can happen at any age. It's not just, you know, it doesn't stop at 40. I have 85, 90 year olds that have put on muscle. And when I was in school, uh, you, there was no way that they uh, considered you could put muscle on after age 35, 40, something like that. And I do it all the time. I have 80 year olds that are stronger with more muscle, uh, than when they started at 70 or 65. I have 90 year olds that have put on muscle. I mean, so the fact that they say, well, you can't put on, that's ridiculous. I mean, if you have function, you can improve upon it. It's that simple. Absolutely. And the only thing is, as you get older, it is more challenging to put on muscle for sure. And it is true that most people, as they get older, get insulin resistance and they do fall apart. Uh, that's true, most do, but they don't have to if they were ancestral people living and still having to push to survive in northern europe through the winters they'd all be lean and muscular you know like the the native indians in america the older people they had look at the shape they were in yeah mm. no it's it, it's not none of this is magic this is pretty simple if you'll honestly and objectively assess you know what, what goes into doing and again we're signal guy what are the signals and if you keep providing these signals in a palatable manner system, these things can be maintained well beyond the chronologically accepted age. And I've seen it so many times. Either, either I've got a, a special genetic pool that have come to me over the years, or there's really something to it universally. Yeah. Absolutely. And you know, one other thing I was going to touch upon, I'm big 
into HRV in the last while, and I have a couple of doctors, and Dr. Nadir Ali in, in Texas, I know you know, eat mostly fat, Ali. Big into the HRV as a metric or a measure, the heart rate variability. And I actually got one of these devices, a Whoop, which Nadir said was the best one, like the Aura Ring and the Whoop are the top of the scale. And it measures the heart rate variability and also measures all of your sleep, your REM cycles, deep sleep, all of that stuff in an algorithm and tells you how recovered you are for strain or exercise and generally how you're doing. So I love it. But HRV, you only began to look into more recently, I think. Yeah, no, I, I've been involved, you know, with heart health, uh, cardiac rehab, uh, heart uh training for elite athletes and for people that have congestive heart failure, angina, stuff like that. So I, I know a little bit about EKGs. I know about heart. I know about how to, you know, stimulate the heart productively and in a healthy manner. So recently this HRV, I mean, people have asked me, I'm supposed to know this because I'm you know, an exercise guy. And I said, what the hell? I mean, I understand the concept. So basically, as I've studied this and asked some guys that I was hoping knew more than I did, and some didn't, some didn't, um, you know, the should cardiologists and things. So basically, I think this heart rate variability is um, a measure of your sympathetic, you know, like fight or flight system and your parasympathetic, you know, cool down, take it easy systems. Those systems are autonomic. They happen, you know, they just happen that we don't physically or mentally make them happen uh, on our, at our command. In any case, there is a balance, there is a yin and yang, there is a, a homeostasis. And, and I think people, when they hear homeostasis, maybe think of flat line, you know, Ivor. But homeostasis, I describe as oscillating, you know, no, you know, vacillating equilibrium. In other words, nothing in our body is, you know, the only time you have, you know, this flat line is when you're dead. And that's, that's a homeostatic uh, milieu that you probably want to avoid. But the point is, um, these things are happening all the time, yin and yang, and then upregulating and downregulating. They happen in a circadian rhythm. They happen in intermittently, these different systems, these different signals, you know, get to a point where they're inhibitory, get to another point where they're stimulatory. So you've got this variation. And every heartbeat kind of reflects that, I think. And so when you take a bunch of heartbeats, and I think purely – heart rate variabilities to be measured at rest. Because obviously, I th and, and, um, and some of the devices you're talking about, I think they measure it all through sleep and stuff like that. So there's a bunch of stuff that goes on during sleep. And sleep, again, is not a flat line situation. There's a bunch of stuff that gets upregulated, downregulated, responded to, stimulated for. Okay, so th that will be reflected in your heart rate variability. And what does that mean? Okay. So every heartbeat has these, these um, um, peaks and valleys, okay? They're called waves, QRST waves, okay? STV waves. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that the heart is what we call polarizing or depolarizing. So it's being relaxed and it's being contracted and relaxed. And it doesn't happen like we would think uh, like a metronome. It's not absolutely the time perfectly because of all this input. If you think about all the stuff that's going on in your brain and your organs and your circulatory system, I mean, God, it's amazing that it can come anywhere near a steady kind of a state. So apparently some people have looked into this and I wasn't one of them uh, and said, if there's a variability, if there's this kind of almost metabolic response flexibility, you know, to handle the different signaling and different patterns, this, this correlates to benefit, to, to other good things being measured. And that, that's what I think heart rate variability is. And so I have some questions. One of my questions is, okay, is, is too much variability? I mean, you can have a syncope, you can have arrhythmias, and that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about on, on a consistent basis for a number of hours in a certain, at a certain level of stimulation, physical stimulation, how is the heart responding to this fight or flight versus this take it easy, relax kind of um, signaling. And it, it appears that if it can be flexible and have some variation, heart rate variation, that this correlates to benefit. And that's my best read on what this stuff is all about. Yep. Well, that's a great summary, actually. And I haven't got into it too deep either. But Dr. Alan Farrell, a good friend of mine, he was the Sky Cycling Team sports doctor. 
He's mega fit, as you can imagine. And he was big into it for the last 20 years. And Donal O'Neill, the producer, and he was an elite athlete also, but he's serial killers on our heart disease movies. He told me he was into it 25 years ago. So I thought, how are, all these guys are into this. But it, it's, as you say, the sympathetic, parasympathetic, basically, when they're imbalanced, the, all of the uh, control of the, of the heart rate is pulled one direction, and it actually makes it very regular intervals. And when they're more balanced in homeostasis and the two systems are working at a balanced level, then the heart rate uh, can actually vary quite a lot. And it's a good thing. It's kind of weird. It's counterintuitive. But the high variability means everything's in great balance. And exactly as you said, that measure just is very powerful for predicting fitness level, long-term outcomes, et cetera, et cetera. And what Whoop do, and I got in trouble, I actually have an affiliate code. I went to them and looked for one, and I don't really do affiliates, but I was so enthused by this thing that I actually went to them. And then I put out a video kind of saying, hey, this is great. And a load of people came back and they didn't like it. You know why? Because it goes to the cloud. They have a cloud-based system to analyze all the data and there's privacy. So I'll say up front, if you're worried about privacy, fair enough. I don't care for my heart rate. But essentially, it, it's an amazing thing because within a week or two of getting one, and um, Dr. Ali, the cardio in Texas, he advised it and he's massive into the science of sleep and HRV. And I got it and literally within a week, I could not believe its power. So basically, if I stay up too late or I don't exercise or I drink too much alcohol, the next day, I mean, it, it's a bloodbath on my, my metrics. My HRV is down, my recovery is poor. It's a disaster, you know, in the graphs. And then if I do the opposite and I'm really good, I get this amazing, pleasing big green bar and the HRV is right up. And in the middle, you know, if it comes up as orange and I kind of feel okay in the morning, uh, by the afternoon, I feel tired. And I realize it was even able to see that coming. So I use it mainly as a keep myself on track, keep myself good. But a lot of the other guys use it to keep advancing their HRV and moving it in the healthier direction, you know, as a real kind of metric to follow. Either way, it's an amazing thing, I'll have to say. Yeah, but see now, something interesting that you just said, they use it to try to keep advancing. So that implies that you have to know how to manipulate the variable, the behavioral variables, I would think, in order to make that happen. That, that's where, the, to me, the, the genius comes in, or that's where the expertise would come in. Because, and I think if you look at the literature that's, that's out on it, it says, of course, what does it say? Um, diet, exercise, <laughs> stress reduction, you know? And so you, you come back to those behaviors, and maybe they'll be able to define or refine or, um, uh, you know, t take down to some actual actionable advice as to you may need more of this or less of that. And that would be kind of cool. And I'm sure people might be working on that as we speak. So that's that's interesting. So I, I always like, you know, ways to measure stuff, you know, whether it be blood glucose or, you know, heart rate or blood pressure. I'm, I'm into that stuff, I think. I'm just fascinated by it. Uh, yeah. And if this is it, another way to do this stuff, this is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, I think it's really cool um, as well. And I, I found it extremely helpful, but I'm not yet in the kind of advancing my athletics uh, phase like a lot yeah. of my friends with this. But for me, it just kind of keeps me. I have a stressful job, you know, blah, blah. Yeah. I'm not whining. <laughs> and, you know, it, it helps me keep on track and not overindulge or, or whatever. But yeah, it's just the, they have algorithms and I do know I did look them up. It's all the time giving tips about your sleep is not ideal. So there's a whole load of tips keep coming up around the sleep and mm -hmm. what you should do. And tonight you should go earlier and aim for oh, X hours. Okay, okay. And um, their algorithm, they admit, although it's proprietary, they admit that your recovery that you're given, which, as I said, is eerily accurate in how you feel that day or later on. It's based mostly on your HRV. That's kind of the master metric, but they okay. also take into account the length of sleep, the REM, the deep sleep, and a whole lot of other things. 
And I think you mentioned an interesting thing because that's the way a metrics guy thinks, and I did too. Well, when you measure it, it can be quite variable uh, on different times of the day or after exercise. So again, their algorithm takes the measurement of HRV in a certain deep sleep period and at certain points in the sleep cycle and okay. samples and using all their data, they found a way to get the best representative HRV for you right. rather than some of the devices. They just tell you the HRV and, right, and there's right. none of that processing to tell you the right HRV. So you can compare day to day, week to week, and you can have a vector and, and be targeting better health. Yeah, it's all in there. Yeah, very well to me, hey, I go over this stuff. I love it. I love learning about it. I love the possibility of, you know, studying it and say, and maybe, you, could, you know, in doing that, we can come up with something that's okay. So this is what you would probably want to do as part of your daily routine, you know, and that to me is so valuable because now yeah. we've got some good information. It's not like I know a guy who did this and he really did well. Oh, that's great. But I mean, you know, we've got this data, we've got this stuff that we can use in, in a productive kind of way to, to make it simpler or to make it clearer as to how you would try to attain this health level or maintain it. Yeah. And that's what it's all about. And you know, I don't know this a hundred percent, but I, I'd be almost certain, and I'm going to look it up. I'd say if you put X hours into the very type of exercise that you described earlier in this chat, yeah. uh, you're going to get way more improvements in HRV and everything else than if you put those X hours into just running around and around like that fat accountant who decides to take up yeah. running yeah. to help. Yeah, no, it'd be, hey, the proof is in the pudding. I, I'm always willing to test. Let's say, hey, let's let's see if, if what we're purporting is actually happening. That, that's fine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So anyway, I know you, you've got a lot to do and that. I'm wondering how we'd wrap this up, this chat, this revisiting. I suppose top advice, and again, I'm thinking of people who are not ultra athletes are already very fit who want to hone it. But for the average person, maybe who's lowered their carb, cut out processed food, and wants to just keep pushing forward, what's your few key bullets of advice for, for those guys listening out there or gals? I mean, I think from a practical level, what are our levers that give us the biggest bang for our buck? What can we do? I, we know that that diet and, and how we eat, when we eat, and what our food's composed of is important. Figure that out for yourself, okay? Ivor has got a great book. I'm not pushing it because he didn't tell me, but that book is ridiculously good. I mean, that's, what is it? Eat well, live long or something? Is that? Eat rich, live long. Yeah, yeah. yeah eat rich, so, I mean, that, well. book is, that book is so well done, it's off the charts. I mean, and the references are like, in, in any case. Um, but my point is, yeah, okay. The, the diet is so important. I, I'm not going to, it's absolutely important because it's so, uh, we, we've been so bad at, at missing the boat on that. And then exercise. What? So what's the best exercise? Number one, the best exercise is the one that you'll do. Number two, the best exercise is an exercise routine that doesn't take much time, that's safe, that's productive, and something you can do at any level of fitness for the rest of your life. People say, how long should I continue to do this exercise? To what age? And I tell them, I would like you to do this exercise until two days after you're dead, just to make sure you're dead. Okay. This is part of your lifestyle. Okay. Let's, let's go there. So exercise, diet, stress reduction, which may be, you know, the, the, uh, the deal you have on the uh, whoop, is it, what is it? Oh, whoop. Yeah. W H O O P. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, you know, measure your sleep, measure your rest, measure your stress. I mean, that, that's, these are the general kind of rules. This is not, this ain't magic. It's not, you know, rocket science. It's actually just common sense. But now we have some real legitimate objective data as to how to do these things. So I, I say stay active, meaning, you know, walk your dog, play tennis, do whatever you want to do, and then exercise. So we got activity, we've got exercise, which is formal and high intensity for you, which is very, very safe, absolutely safe. And then watch what you eat and make sure that the energy you take in you know, is something reasonable so that we're not overwhelmed with this fat storage problem. It's not the, it's not the food we eat. It's how we store this energy. That's really probably the problem, but obviously it's related to what we eat. So diet, exercise, stress reduction, you know, uh, enjoy life a little bit. I think, you know, life's, life's too short. So try, try to look on the bright side because what other choice do you have? So 
that that's that's my philosophy of life and health Ivor. Yeah, well, I can, as you well know, I can resonate with that, Ben. And uh, absolutely, yeah. And nutrient-dense food, you know, just to your latter point, if you're going to eat food, make sure it's bringing in a load of nutrients and it's not hollow. Uh, and if you just do that alone, uh, you'll do pretty okay on the food side. You know, it'll cut out a lot of processed milk for sure. <laughs> absolutely. Great stuff. So anyway, delighted to see you again, Ben. And we're going to have to circle back again in a few a few weeks or months and, and keep in touch and keep yeah. motivating people out there to, yeah, let to me know just when you're improve in the their health. We've got to get together, come to one of our conferences or something, and we can do our thing. Absolutely, Ben. Looking forward to it. Great stuff, man. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ivor. As always, hope you enjoyed that. And... Ben is just such a great character. Uh, he's a great guy. Also, I mentioned the Whoop device there during the uh, discussion, and Ben was not too well up on HRV, but my friend, Dr. Nadir Ali, cardiologist in Houston, Texas, he has done amazing research on sleep and stress and all the heart rate variability vectors. So he told me about it, and he basically said pretty much the Whoop is the best device go straight for that. Now it is a monthly sign up and yes, your data goes to the cloud. And I know some people have a problem with sharing personal data and, and that's fine. Me personally, I'm not worried about this data. I go for the yearly annual sign up. It's a significant discount and I can offer a further discount, 20% off the package. So it's a pretty good deal. Now it does give me a little, helps keep my train on the track. You know, I, I'm not overly popular with the corporates and uh, I do need to have an income for my family of five. So hands up, yes, I make a little on that. But for me, the Whoop device is superb. It keeps me on track. It warns me when I've been doing the bad thing. You know, it taps on my shoulder. Incredible data comes out around your heart rate variability, your sleep quality. And I found even in very stressful times, and you know I've been out there, I've got a lot of pushback. But the reality is this helps me to focus in and refocus in. And you can also use it for tracking very technologically and closely your fitness improvements or your sporting prowess. You, it can be part of your recipe for that. For me, it's just to keep on the straight and narrow, keep a healthy lifestyle, correct course when I go a little off and see the improvements that I make or over tough periods, see that I'm disimproving and take action. So a superb device. It is monthly or a year up front and 20% discount here with the code. The link is down below. Completely up to you. I'm not pushing anything hard. And I know the data sharing is a question for some. I'll just say not for me because I know there's devices now that at 10 feet away can get your heart rate variability in any case. So the technology is there for those of you who are really worried about Big Brother. So just mentioning that and, uh, you know, completely up to you. I find it fantastic. That's me personally. That's the absolute truth. But it may not be for everyone. So look up the links I've provided check it out see what you think and like i said the discount code is there for 20 percent off try it for a period and i hope if you do that you find it as superb to be quite honest uh, that i do so thanks very much guys and until next time